Thank you, Jones, for that beautiful uh, rendition. Now, it's a great honor for me to introduce our speaker this morning. Our speaker was born in Osami City, Philippines, to Mr. Ruben Rivelo and Mrs. Lea Kainglit Obidencio. He was one younger sibling uh, with the name of Levin, who is in Estancia Iloilo uh, in the Philippines. Now, he finished his Bachelor of Arts in Theology at Mountain View College, where I also finished. Most of our speakers here uh, graduate that we have invited. Uh, most of them uh, graduated at Mountain View College, uh, where he was exposed to different leadership roles as a student elder, assistant pastor, and the president of smaller clubs. After graduation, he was called to work as an evangelist in Western Mindanao Conference, particularly in Pagadian City, a beautiful city, and in the municipality of Naga, now belongs to Sambuanga Peninsula Mission. He felt the need for further studies and took masters in religion in the area of biblical studies, a major in the Old Testament at our general conference-owned educational institution called Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in Silang Cavite, Ayas. Beyond his expectation of doing teaching ministry for 16 years, he was called to the gospel ministry in December 2014 to pastor Trinity Adventist International Church in Bangkok. Thailand. And six months later, in 2015, he was appointed by the Thailand Adventist Mission as the executive committee to be the central zone to secretary of the then 22 English speaking churches and was reappointed the same position in January 2016 until 2020. Uh, with CZ2 has grown to uh, 33 congregations. He has also pastored Thunburi is the church from 2016 to March 2018 and Bangpra International Seventh Adventist Church in Chunburi in April of 2018 and Pattaya Church. Uh, Pattaya, I'm sure uh, uh, it's very familiar to all of you. Uh, added since January 2019 to June 2020. He was a district pastor, leader of Ask District, Anthong Singburi. Kenchanaburi and Supanburi churches in Thailand. Four provinces, a total of 633 kilometers about in 11 hours travel. No, there's a lot of travels. <laughs> he traveled every Sabbath for an average of 450 kilometers. Yeah, because these churches are long away from each other. He even experienced preaching to a church while driving. Yes, in fact, last Saturday, uh, I assigned, uh, he was supposed to be the preacher. And uh, I, I, I thought, oh dear, you know, he will be traveling because he, is, he will be preaching somewhere. And he said that I'll be preaching, uh, it doesn't matter, I'm just going to stop my car. You know, so that's the passion and the dedication of our speaker to share God's word, even in the car. <laughs> Amen. Since his contract with the Thailand Adventist Mission ended in December 31, 2020, he has been happily doing bivocational freelance ministry, that is ministry outside or inside the church. Following Apostle Paul of tent making, as we all know, ministry through employment and business as mission as recently promoted by the Global Mission, the Adventist mission of General Conference to teach all classes of people and reach by a typical gospel ministry, which is very effective in our present situation. Our speaker is married to former Christy uh, Fetalbero, who is also here, but welcome ma'am, from uh, Pinamalayan Oriental Mindoro. Okay. And they have now two children, Christian who is 14 and Kirsten who is 12. Our speaker does not believe that greatness in God's kingdom is by our own power and by our might, but by God's Holy Spirit only as Zechariah for success. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our speaker is a friend of mine, a humble servant and an active spiritual leader who is no other than Pastor Roli Kainlet Obidencio. Let us pay him, pay, him, pay him our undivided attention as he delivers God's message to us. Take it away, Pastor. Happy Sabbath to all. 
I would like to say happy Sabbath once again to those of you who are in different places from Norway. And I understand that some are in the neighboring countries, right? And we are so international. Yeah, I can see your faces here and my screen with several other uh, names on here. And uh, there are about 37, maybe more of us right now. And I'm so glad and thankful to Pastor Delfred for inviting me here. Also with his wife, Hannah. I am an avid a watcher, of, a viewer of your, this, um, uh, this tech, uh, uh, this is Take the Talk, right? <laughs> and uh, interesting. And uh, it's an encouraging series of messages for all of us. And uh, right now, we are here in Thailand, also lockdown, as I believe you are in a lockdown also, right? Uh, no wonder you are having this online worship, okay? And uh, the good thing about this is that the Bible is so clear that true worshipers are not limited to time, to place, right? But we worship in spirit and in truth, amen? And uh, we believe amen. that uh, since we are here together and... We have this one purpose at this time, that is to glorify God, to worship God in whatever we are doing right now. And so it's a big opportunity for me, uh, despite our distance, that we are not limited by our distance. And then we are online, but we are in one heart because we, I believe we are in one God and we worship the same God. Amen. And so for us, this time, I would like to, before I go further, I would like to actually uh, give a little bit of an introduction that uh, the mother of Pastor Delfred has been my, she, she was my, uh, I think, uh, schoolmate there in the Gatsby School. And so we happen to get to know each other. And so you see, knowing each other will somehow introduce us to where we are right now or wherever we are, we would like to go someday. Uh, I would like to thank you also for what you're doing. And I'm so proud of what you're doing right now there in Norway. It's a bit challenging, you know, uh, <laughs> away from home. You are there and your families are in your respective places, maybe in the Philippines or wherever they are now. It's a big challenge with this pandemic. And so thank you also, uh, Sister Joms, for the music. It's wonderful. And uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Let me share to you my screen. And I believe this will be uh, interesting for all of us. Some of us are so visual. Like if you just see me and you'll be wondering what those words are instead of you wondering what those words are, we view the same thing. And so we can be exactly in the same page when you see those things visually, all right? And that is what I've been doing since I've been teaching for a long time. And most students are really, really visual and that will give us a better understanding when things are shown and online and we see in there and we actually are not left to thinking like what does the speaker mean to say, all right? Uh, I'm not sure if you are able to see my screen right now. It says here in my screen is still preparing the slides. Uh, it's, it's not showing up yet. Preparing PowerPoint. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, there. Yeah, there. It, it's, it's in there now. All right. That's good. That's good. All right. Okay. And so here it is. Uh, let me. Well, I love this. Uh, view in Norway. Okay. All right. And I, I like that. Perhaps someday, uh, maybe to you, it's not new anymore to us. It's something like a dream that we want to, to visit. All right. Someday, somehow. Okay. I would like to say happy Holy Sabbath. All right. If that is new to you, let me tell you what it means. That Sabbath is a happy day and a holiday, so I call it a happy holy Sabbath, is because it is indeed a happy and holy Sabbath according to the scripture. And I believe that all of us are believers of scripture, right? 
Are we on the same page? The scripture? Well, some say call it Bible. I just call it scripture because I believe the principles in the scripture are actually applicable to all people at all times. So I am not more into a religion. I am more into principles. I have a page called like Pastor Rolly. If you can see the top of my page, it says there, I am more into principle, eternal principles. And so let us get something from this passage, extract something, the principles that can be applied to all people at all time, regardless of our affiliation. And it says there in Genesis, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array by the seventh day. Okay, now let us be clear. Seventh day is Saturday. God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, take note, he rested from all his work. We call it today, if there's no work, we call it holiday, right? When Friday comes, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> Why? Saturday doesn't have work. We call it a holiday. So literally here, rested, Shabbat in Hebrew means holiday in what we term today. From all his work, then God blessed the seventh day, the second thing he did, and made it holy. You see that? Three things, very important things. In, in here, we see that Saturday or seventh day is a holiday from the word rested or Shabbat in Hebrew means rested from work. And that is holiday. We call it in American English. We call it vacation. We call it in British English holiday. And so that holiday is not the same holiday as we think today. It is a kind of a holy holiday, right? He made it holy. That is why Saturday, the only day in the week, which is both a holiday and a holiday. Let me claim at this time and announce that there's only one day in a week. Okay, look, uh, let me remind that my top topic is not about the Sabbath nor a heavy idea on the Sabbath. I'm just giving the idea that in a week, God is so good. He's giving us one day a week, which is a holiday and a holiday. And if we go further into that, which is not my topic, at uh, this time here, morning in your time, afternoon in my time, my topic today, that there's only one very special day in a week. Whenever I have been my, I'm with my family, that is also a holiday for the family. And so whenever we hear happy Sabbath day, it should be the Sabbath should be a blessing for the family. That is why if we understand more on that. There should be more time for indoor and outdoor. Besides, if we can see in Exodus 29 to 10 and Leviticus 19.3, it is the whole family, all your family, parents here are equated to, I mean, honoring the parents in the text in Leviticus 19.3 is equated to keeping the Sabbath holy. So that is very wonderful for us that the Sabbath should be a holy day and a holiday. However, we need to think of some ideas to make day as a very wonderful day for all of us. That is why to me, it's a really, really special day. However, we would like to explore on, on, on Google and we Google the word happy Sabbath. We don't see much of a Sabbath day as a holiday. Instead, we see here happy Sabbath, but we see nature and all the, you know, all the pictures, but not much of this picture with the family. Now, with this understanding that Sabbath is a holiday and a holiday, we have a better understanding that it is the only day in a week, which is holiday and holiday. If we understand the Bible, Sunday is not a holiday. In the 12th century, later on, the word holiday was introduced. It was originally like a holy day, but later on, the word vacation, like whatever you can do and travel, that is a late thing. And so in here, Sabbath should be a day that we should be happy because it is a holiday and a holiday. After all, when we get to heaven, it's a day of rejoicing. Amen? When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Oh, wonderful, right? Because that is a holiday, a Sabbath day with God and not that only one day in heaven. We'll be spending with him to eternity. Wow, wonderful. Brothers and sisters, friends, that is why our message 
the Sabbath is, I believe, from God. And so let me start by saying this one. I've been looking for some pictures in Norway or in Europe in which people are hit by the train. But I couldn't find in Norway. I believe your country is very, very, you know, <laughs> careful. Although I see in some areas here, Syrian refugees sleep on railway lines near the train station of Idomini, northern Greece. Why would they sleep there and the railway when there are other places around beside that one? Okay. Now we can see that even some of them were even told by the police, hey, not there. Why would you sleep there? Okay. And this phenomenon is not just one instance. It is in here. Desperate migrants curl up on railway lines. Not only one family, not only one person. Several people are doing this here in Macedonia. As they head to Germany and Austria, where convoys of cars queue up to help them when they arrive. Why is that? Why would they actually sleep there on the railway? And this phenomenon, the sleeping on the railway, is not just in one country. Now, as I searched on Google, I have found out that it is being practiced and done in many countries. Why would they sleep there? I do not understand. I would not dare do that, you know? I would not dare do that sleeping on the railway. And for example, in Thailand, you know, uh, in here, this is in 2015, man attracts hit and head by the train. Can you imagine? All right. <laughs> here is a, a piece of news. Long time ago, more than six years ago. Nakon Ratchasima, where the mother of Pastor Delfred is located right now. A man sleeping near railroad tracks suffered a serious head injury when he was struck by a train in Chakara district on Monday morning. Can you imagine? Adul Tong Un was napping beside the tracks when he was hit by metal framing in front of Obun Ratchatani bound train number 425 as it neared a platform at Chakara station. <laughs> Paramedics administered first aid to Mr. Adul, who was unconscious after the accident, and took him to district hospital, where he was later transferred to Maharat Nakon Ratasima Hospital. Chakarat Police Investigator Pol uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anorot Santo said it was not known where the man was from and why he was sleeping there. <laughs> Can you imagine? He asked hospital staff to test the victim's blood alcohol level and question the train's driver. Instead of questioning the one sleeping, the driver was instead the one being questioned. <laughs> what a thing. <laughs> right? Now, it did not happen in Thailand. It happened in India. 16 workers laid off, you know, coronavirus lockdown. They were hit by the train. What is that? If you're going to explore here, fatalities in U.S. railroad accidents from 2005 to 2019. There's a lot of them by hundreds every year. What is that? What kind of phenomenon? Not only in USA, but in other countries also. Well, well, well. Friends, let me moralize this. There is a train in life that we need to be aware of that is ringing. Toot, 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 toot. It's coming. But how many of us are taking heed of the warning? The train of life is coming, whatever the train is. Let us explore further what it means in our topic this Sabbath, this Saturday. What is the train of life that we need to actually listen to? We need to be aware. We need to take heed. We need to be warned. And we need to respond. Does it give you or us a sense of complacency sleeping on railway track? When I look at these people like, oh, maybe it's so nice. You know, I don't have any pillow, maybe sleeping on the railway road. Like, oh, maybe nice. Maybe perhaps the train driver would stop the train when they see me, when he sees me sleeping there. I should say that that is not a very wise thing to do. When we see any train of a life coming, we are not to assume that maybe the driver will stop and maybe the train will stop because that train is on a momentum. 
And then it's very hard to stop a heavy object with this on the momentum. Friends, let me apply this trend of life in many areas in our life so we will see what it means. I will give you a series of illustration and how it can be applied. That at this time of the pandemic, there is a trend of life that we need to take heed. Our text is found in Proverbs 1.32, right? For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Before we extract the principle of this text and apply in several areas of our life, my request is one to pray with me. So we will see the lesson from God's perspective and not from our own perspective. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I am your speaking servant at this moment. Oh Lord, I am just a human being, limited in understanding and limited in my language and faulty. And we cannot exactly fathom the death of your mystery, of your love, of your kindness, of your salvation at this time, O oh Lord, we want to be covered by your righteousness, O oh Lord. Please forgive us of our weaknesses, of our sins, both deliberate and unintentional sins, O oh God. So we'll be covered by your righteousness and we'll be worthy to listen to you at this time that we see things from your perspective. Thank you, dear God, for answering our prayer that all of us will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage is one of the passages that I like to expound. You see that? The waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Can you imagine? If you like to read the King James Version, only you do not read the word complacency. This is from NASB, one of the most literal versions of the Bible. Now, what is complacency? All right. Perhaps if you like the word complacency, complacency for non-native speakers of English. Let me expand a bit more of complacency because it is not so clear for non-native speakers what this word means. All right. Well, I Google it and I have found out that complacency in here is much represented by Merriam-Webster here itself. It says self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. It means there's a danger coming. There's a deficiency in the situation. And you are self-satisfied, but you are unaware so much. Actually here, complacency is not doing enough when a danger is coming. It is not just self-satisfaction. It is actually just being, doing nothing or not doing enough when a danger is coming. You know that the danger is coming, but you are not just doing it like there's an examination coming. You will be probably judged by your teacher at the end of the, the term at the end of the year. But then, oh, anyway, I'm a very wonderful individual. I am so sharp. I can do 101% even if I don't study. Being complacent at the end of the day, when that time comes, you'll find out that your understanding is limited and there might be some things there that you missed. That complacency will bring you <laughs> not a perfect score, but perhaps less than perfect. Well, if you translate it into this language in Tagalog, it means like kasiyahan. <laughs> well, it doesn't exactly represent. Well, let's translate it into Cebuano, where I speak the language Cebuano. My wife speaks uh, Tagalog because uh, she is from Mindoro and my address is moved to Mindoro because she is from there. Complacency means pag contento. It's not even enough. It's not represented. Well, complacent, campanti. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's not really enough. Well, here, campanti also in Cebuano. But if we go to your language in Norwegian language, complacency, like, I don't know how to pronounce it, like self fred shit. I don't know how it is pronounced. Well, I hope it represents exactly what complacency is, like a feeling or a smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself, you know, but you're not doing enough when the danger is coming. Well, I'm, I'm glad that my son is here with me. I have a son who keeps on telling me, dad, here, I, I'm showing to you my son right here with me, okay? I have a son right here, a 14-year-old boy, but a lot taller than I am. 
he keeps telling me, Dad, uh, the car tires are actually now cracking and it's time for us to change tires. And the following day, Dad, the oil is actually more than that and it's time to change oil. Dad, well, he keeps on telling me regularly and he's not a complacent person and just perhaps for him and for me to be awakened that it's time to do something and not to be complacent, otherwise something happen. Something will, you know, something dangerous will happen to my family when I drive to a long distant place. Thank you, son, for doing that. That is not being complacent, all right? So what is complacency? Here, let me give you this quotation. Dear complacency, oh, the damage you can do. You have no place here. <laughs> The tragedy of life is not found in failure, but complacency. Take note. Not one in you doing too much. That is complacency. Not doing enough. But doing too little. Not in you living above your means, but below your capacity. Did you see that? It's not failure, but aiming too low. That is also complacency. That is life's greatest tragedy. Friends, brothers and sisters, let me talk more about complacency. If you're going to explore the word complacency among English versions, you would find out that about 24 of the English versions use the word complacency or complacent 24 times. Look at this one. These other English versions outdating the King James Version, and you'll find out that it is not actually a single little thing it is a big thing not so much emphasized but if you go into other translations especially if you go into hebrew text you will find out that the original word talks about that complacency let me mention about here again from our text in asb for the waywardness of the naive will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them I have the second point that I'm espousing right now. Why does complacency kill? I want, you to, I want to give you a tip of interpretation from the Old Testament that the Hebrew people use parallelism that one phrase or one clause or one, one statement is actually defined by the previous or the, the next one. Here, parallelism here. Fools and naive are defined as single and the same thing. Fools and naive are the same. And complacency and waywardness here are meant to be the same thing. Complacency here is understood as waywardness being not on track of what is right, being wayward, you know, away from what is right. <laughs> you see that? Look, another version again, for an older version of, of NASB, New American Standard Bible, for the faithlessness of the naive will kill them. Can you imagine that? faithlessness, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Complacency here is parallel with the word faithlessness. Where can you find in the scripture where the word faithlessness is mentioned? All right. Now you will perhaps see in, in, in John 3, 16, the opposite implied in here. For God to love the world that he gave the only begotten son, so that everyone believing, literally in King James Version, it doesn't say that. Everyone who believes or believeth, like a regular thing to do every like a present simple tends to do you know regularly but in the original greek no everyone believing if you literally translate here like this with the sense in the grammar it would sense like this everyone who keeps on believing in other words everyone who keeps exercising faith not just regular every but continuously that is the one will have eternal life the opposite of that is Faithfulness. In other words, it is implied in a passage that anyone who, who stop believing, who does not exercise faith, who is faithless, will have eternal death. I'm not scaring each one, all right? We just get a principle out of this text that this principle applies in other areas of life, all right? Look, have you known about this Buddhist monk who was dead? He's from Myanmar. Well, you can go to YouTube with this one. You can take a photo of this and uh, search that on Google. Look it up on Google. Buddhist monk, hell and heaven testimony. And he was actually back. He was resurrected. I should say he came back to life after he was dead for several days. And he mentioned about his death experience, you know. 
And uh, in, in there, he was shown of some people in heaven why this particular person is not in heaven. Why such particular very uh, popular celebrity is not in heaven. Why that religious leader is not in heaven. He mentioned in the video that because they did not believe in Jesus as the savior of the world. Well, friends, if you're not a believer yet of Jesus, I'm not imposing on you, okay? Or anybody. It's up to you. It's, it's a choice. It's one choice to believe. But this man is a good testimony. I don't have time to, to really give him the chance to tell us at 16 minutes. You can explore more on that, and it is a very powerful testimony. Or you can probably research its authenticity. But that is a very powerful testimony. Friends, I had a French colleague in my previous uh, workplace a few months ago. I, am, I was a new teacher at the workplace, and he said, Rolly, we have known that you are a pastor. I said, how do you know? Well, I just, I went to the head, you know, the, the department head, and uh, saw your resume. <laughs> Why would he go there and uh, see my resume? I have known that you're a pastor. It really took time to research and who I was, who I am. I said, yeah, well, 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 I am not a atheist. I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I want to debate with you about religion. And I said, well, uh, thank you, friend. I, I do not actually engage in debate. I want to debate with you here in the presence of this, our teachers. Tell us about religion. And I was just smiling, you know, uh, making friend with him and with anybody, uh, not showing, you know, combativeness or argumentation or whatever. What is religion? Religion is about, you know, belief in God who would control us. You know, he, he talks a lot about religion. I was just listening to him. And I said, and he gave me time and he said, okay, your turn. Okay. Thank you, friend. Uh, to me, religion can be defined that way. However, there are several definitions of what religion is. I look at it from the perspective of a belief system. All right. Like when you, when, when you look at a belief system, it's a set of principles or tenets like any religion has a belief system. Your organization has a belief system. It has core values. When you put up an organization, you have some core values based on a belief system. How does that sound to you? And he said to me, well, I, that seems acceptable. Yeah, it's a belief system. Like even a culture is a belief system. Well, I am not much into a religion. I am more into a belief system. Like you have your own belief system. You can choose your belief. I have my own belief system. I rather look at it from this perspective and which a lot is more acceptable by anyone because anybody's belief is a belief system. It's a part of belief system, right? And I said, yes, I, have, I, I think so. Well, we had a common ground on that. It was just unfortunate that I didn't stay long in that workplace and I was called somewhere else. Well, it's a belief system. Let us go farther with this belief system. We will extract the principle and apply in our daily life. Revelation 21, it is so clear. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, all right? The detestable. I don't want you to read the rest of the text. I am uh, the text. I'm just emphasizing the idea of the faithless one. That the faithless one here is in the passage in here. Actually, well, I am not telling each one of us. The passage is so clear, the one we read in, 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 in John 3.16, the one who keeps doing it. You do, if we do it only once and it's a mistake, we are not being faithless in that sense. Maybe it's just one, one time. In here, it's a, like the whole life being faithless, the one who keeps exercising the faithlessness until our life here on earth is up. That is the one, the faithless one, the whole life. That is the one which is in danger. To some point in our life, we become faithless and our life goes up and down. We are not exempted. This may apply to anybody, even to me. At some point in my life, I became faithless, but that does not make us faithless throughout our life. All right? So that faithlessness is dangerous, you know, is, is, is actually coined with the word complacency. So why does complacency kill? There is NCV here. I'm just giving you several nuances of the word complacency because it is full of meaning. It is pregnant in meaning. And in here, fools will die because they refuse to listen. 
<laughs> they will be destroyed because they do not care. Look at that. The word complacency means not caring enough. What is to be cared for? And the parallel meaning is according to this new century version is refuse to listen. Isn't it that the scripture is full of warning when we refuse to listen? Like Exodus 15, 26, it's an illustration. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you what? Any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. In other words, in their time, disease was commonly understood as being the result or consequence of not listening, not following, not carefully following God. And so because in here, God would bring them diseases. All right. Well, isn't a sort of a warning for all of us if you don't listen to, to God, to his principles, to his law, health laws? Try sleeping for the whole day, 24 hours for one week. Let us see if you don't get sick. Or try violating the laws of health. For example, here, you know about type 2 diabetes, right? That it is a lifestyle disease. Anybody who is a nurse here, a doctor, you'd find that a type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder. It's like an eating, an eating disorder that causes sugar, the glucose, to accumulate in the blood after eating. All right. When you're younger, below 50 or below 40, it's okay that your body can metabolize, you know, your insulin produced by your pancreas can burn that sugar so that it will not accumulate in the bloodstream. And so you will not have hypertension. I mean, you will not have hypertension. But when you get 50 years old and you are, you have a metabolic syndrome, you know, <laughs> it shows in, in your size of your body, in your, you know, uh, the size of your waistline is big and your, uh, you know, uh, well, metabolic syndrome. If you understand, if we understand this, like we are obese, having metabolic syndrome, diabetes is just knocking at the door. When we increase the sugar in our body because we are not careful, all right? And you see that one? And we, we, when we have metabolic syndrome, because we do not know how it operates, it actually complicates other areas of our life, all right? We already know that when we get older, we are not actually younger anymore and our pancreas does not function very well. And we still keep on sitting, sleeping after eating. That is very, very dangerous. Why you let your insulin burn that one as we get older, our insulin does not burn that efficiently anymore. We are to really walk. And in 2015 study of two Japanese scientists, Found out that you just walk for 15 to 30 minutes after eating, then you will just burn, you know, the, the glucose becoming glycogen into your bloodstream and you will save yourself from diabetes. And if you do it for five years, 10 years, it's dangerous. All these other parts of the body will be affected. If we are not careful, the heart and blood vessel disease will come, the nerve will be damaged, kidney disease will come, eye damage, slow healing, hearing impairment, well, sleep apnea, dementia. Do you notice when you go to when you reach that age of about 50 plus, you wake up many times in the night, even if you don't like to get up because you go, you need to go to the bathroom. That is, besides drinking a lot of water, but that is the sugar there that is to be removed, to be excreted from our body because we are not burning it enough. Our insulin is not burning enough because it's not functioning well. That is why three or four hours before sleep, have dinner and walk because if you don't do that, <laughs> you will be caught up. It will take a toll in our life. It's actually... You know, better to prevent it. We know that that train of life physically is coming and we are not taking, you know, take, we are not taking care of it. We're not taking care of our food. We're not being active. We're not losing weight. We are, you know, especially this time of pandemic. The best thing actually is to have an OMAD one meal a day. And that will give us longevity because it will produce some growth hormones in our body. If you cannot endure one meal a day, why not two mad, two meals a day? Or intermittent fasting, like 16 hours of fasting. In the morning, you eat at about 10 or maybe the next one will be at 4 p.m. 
We do that with my, my family two times a day. I'm not setting an example here for, for you to, you know, to follow or impose this idea to you. It's up to you, but we understand this one. I have a friend who keeps telling us, Pastor, uh, I keep on moving around and uh, helping other people. They came to me, oh, brother, can you pray for me? I have a diabetes. And he would just say to anybody who's a diabetes, what brother, sister, it would take more than 10 years to develop diabetes. And you expect us to really heal that diabetes in an instance right now? Don't you know that it's like a train coming to you for how many, how many decades when you're not being careful when you reach that age? Physically, it's a train of life coming to us, but we are not heeding the natural cause of diabetes. It will take a toll on us if we are not careful. Very simple thing. Very simple prevention that we are not careful. That physical train of metabolic disease will come to us. It's a biblical principle, isn't it? Right? If we do not follow the laws of health, the disease will come to us. That is a biblical principle. Now applicable in health. I was looking for some pictures during pandemic in, in Norway, but it seems like it's just very few suicide tendency in, uh, in Norway. Very, very few, very low. But if you come to Thailand, Thailand has the highest number of suicides in here because of restricting anyone during this pandemic last year, as you can see. COVID-19 blamed for the rising rate of suicide in Thailand. Can you imagine that? Especially those who are alone here. With Southeast Asia's highest suicide rate, Thailand grapples with mental health challenge amid pandemic. Friends, do not be alone. It's, you are so lucky that you are right now here together with us because science shows, research shows that when we are together weekly with other people, even here during the pandemic, you become stronger, you become happy, your immune system becomes stronger when we are happy because it produces some hormones, serotonin, dopamine, and all those happy hormones that will strengthen our immune system. The cause of suicide in Thailand actually is financial hardship spiking Thailand suicide rate. Can you imagine? Well, <laughs> Oh, as you can see here, lack of financial literacy causes anxiety with millennials. Is it correct? This is not my idea. This is research shows its report, its news. Well, if we go to, back to the Bible, there are a lot of principles in the scripture actually about preparing, even during this time of pandemic. It's been a year. We see some principles of savings, some principles of investing, some principles applied in business. For example, God owns everything in, in Psalm 24. One. God owns everything, including our life. It's not ours if you accept that idea. Even our silver, our gold, it means our money in Haggai 2.8. It is owned by God. In other words, the moment we receive the salary, oh God, thank you. This is not mine. This is yours. Is your blessing. And when we recognize him as our Lord and the giver of this blessing, we recognize him as the Lord of our life. And that is in here. In other words, the 100% of our income is not ours. It's his. It's God's. But then lend to us for his purposes. How many of us do not know about this one? Look, uh, let me just tell you about this because probably we need some reminders. 100% is to be used to build an asset. What is an asset? Pastor, what are you talking about? You're a pastor talking about an asset. An asset is, is a thing that gives us income back or money back. And here, it can be in terms of eternal blessing, it can, eternal investment. So 100% of the blessing we receive from God should be used for, for his glory. How is that possible? If we understand here, let us not, I'm idea, exposing the idea of complacency, right? In here, in Deuteronomy 8.18, the Bible is so clear. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. But then whenever we receive our salary, we forgot, oh, I need to go to the mall I need to go to. We forgot the giver of our life, the one who gives us the power to get wealth. Without him, I believe we would not have any job income in Norway, in France, or in any other country. It is he who gives us the power to make wealth because he's the source of our blessings, that he may confirm his covenant, that he swore to your fathers, it is this day. It is actually 
a part of his covenant with us that he fulfills his promise to us when he we keep our part of the covenant. We read in Galatians 3.14, in order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, we are Gentiles, in Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This text is a lot to talk about. It's, in, it's not just talking about this uh, wealth. It's talking about covenant, this God's covenant before we understood during the Sabbath school. It's the same everlasting covenant. What I'm trying here to talk about is that God empowers us to build an asset. And if we understand that, we actually address the idea of financial problem that we are not to be complacent because the Bible is so clear on that. But are we taught that way? 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is so clear. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, it means in our occupation, whatever your occupation is, we do it to the glory of God or God's glory. In other words, your money making, your occupation, whatever that is, is not bad. All right? That is an asset for God's glory. All right? Whatever we do is an asset, should be an asset for God's glory. Because God wants us that everything we have, we receive from him, is for his glory. It's a wonderful idea. That idea of saving is in the scripture. Now, example in Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe that is tenth part of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. Right? Look, tithe that is 10% of your income is holy. Holy means set aside for a holy purpose. But look. How we've been taught many times, and there are many verses in the scripture, like for example, he, Numbers 18 9, that offering is most holy. While tithe is holy, offering is most holy. But research shows when I was with Thailand Mission, you know, uh, for about six years, only less than 1% is given to the offering. All right. And everybody just, oh, yeah, return tithe. Okay. But then the offering which is most holy is not given attention. Well, uh, friends, I am not espousing the idea to you right now, but, you know, impo nor imposing about the tithe and, and this offering because I am your pastor. I collect offering. Actually, no. In the 70 Adventist Church, we don't collect tithe and offering from members. Okay. There is a proper channel for that. We are not in the congregational, con you know, congregationalist type of, of organization. But even non-religious organizations like IMG and other you know, organizations, they promote the idea of tithing because they recognize God. And you see how, how blessed they are. It is from the Bible. Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? <laughs> You're robbing me, but you say not actually in tithes and offerings. In, in verse 10, when it says here, the whole tithe, it includes, there are many kinds of tithes. There are many kinds of offerings. It is here in a parenthetical here. It is an ellipsis that it talks about tithes and offerings that we may be robbing God. This passage actually is almost like a prosperity gospel passage. We look at in verse in here. If we can see in verse uh, 11, you will find out in here that I, I will not open for you here. You, you bring the whole tithe, including the offerings, into the whole storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out your blessing until it overflows, is it possible, brothers and sisters, friends, that when we are, you know, uh, having a financial problem, is it possible that because we violate the law of God as our owner by robbing him of what this is and what is to be used for him? Well, whatever your religious affiliation is, and I believe a lot of other organizations which are not religious, they practice tithing and they found out that they have been blessed. Why not try this principle used by the Jews before? Actually, if we are going to understand more of that, there is more of that that we do not know yet. For example, in here. So at least from this passage, this 10% plus at least one person, that is for eternal investment. But, but what do we do with the 90%? Remember? Remember? The whole 100 percent is God's, but then we just waste 90 percent anywhere else, you know, and without doing it for God's glory. It's so clear in the Bible that if we do not save like this ant during summertime saving for the winter, we will be in trouble. Saving is biblical here, wise and wealthy and luxury, but full spend. <laughs> Look at that. It's so clear. 
All right. In Matthew 25 to 26 to 27, investing is biblical. But have you been taught this way? Everything is from the Bible. Now, and here I'm not preaching Warren Buffett or Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett. I'm giving the idea that invest in seven or eight ventures. That is biblical. And if you do not take heed of that, we depend only on one source of income. During this pandemic, if you are an employee or you, have a, you are a small business owner, it's a headache. Because during the pandemic, this kind of people or kind of earners are the ones actually, well, <laughs> unless God saves us from this problem. That basically, if you have only one source of income, the Bible is so clear, invest. And that is not to be complacent because in this time of pandemic, if you're being complacent, oh, that's why now I understand Warren Buffett is really following what the Bible says. It's been, they've been given by God because they follow this principle. Imagine he has had 60 companies. Louis Chutan has 300 companies. We know that. Well, I'm not preaching the idea of money here, prosperity preaching. I am here exposing the idea that complacency in other areas. Now we talk about health. We talk about finances, like even the source of, you know, like problem in, in this lockdown that stress financially gives, you know, some people the option to commit suicide. If our basket is just only one basket and everything is placed in there, what happens if the basket is drops there? Well, all the eggs that we have, they are gone. It's so clear. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. But look, a lot of us want to get into like get quick scheme, you know? The Bible is so clear. Wealth from get quick get rich quick schemes quickly disappears a lot of them in the philippines but hard work grows the bible again is reminding us we are complacent in many areas in the use of our money no we are steward we're financial steward we are not to be complacent that not only tithe act to be used for god's glory for eternal investment even our savings for insurance for investment for our emergency at least nine percent of that is to be used for our family, build a passive asset for our family. Because during this time of pandemic, if we build enough, you know, then we have enough time like the ants, you know, they save. What do we do with the 80%? Oh, we just use it, that, that budget for expenses. We just use anywhere, but without money in return. Well, if we are really wise from the biblical principle, you can build a passive asset money back into your pocket from your expenses too. In other words, the 100% can be used for God's glory in here for the use for God's temple, for his work, religious purposes, this is one for your family and, and, and helping other people. Well, if our budget is just very low because income is low, well, this is a practical application. You can increase from 10% to 9 to to 10, following here, 15, and then reduce the expenses until you pay some debt, and then it increases to 15, 15. Uh, we call that today like 15, 15, 70 budget rule, or you can increase it into 20, 15 to 65, you know, for needs. Uh, let me just go over it quickly. Until such time, you will reach 20, 20 savings and, you know, uh, and, and tithes and offerings, because if we understand more about the Jews, actually the Jews, if we understand deeper, they actually spend about 25% of their income to even 33 for religious purposes. But we don't know. We've, we've not been taught that way. Well, if we follow the biblical principles, it would grow like this until you reach the sixth year or seven years. This demonstration actually until you reach at this level, 30, 20, 50 rule, budget rule. That is actually a demonstration of what Pastor Mark Batterson said. When God blesses you financially, don't raise your standard of living. Raise your standard of giving. You can see that? If you can see that one, the expenses is reduced, right? That is a demonstration of that principle. But have we been complacent that we just use God's money anywhere else? We are actually accountable to God if we just use money for our wants and not to be used for his glory. That 100% that is actually for God's work in this is religious for your family and to help other people. Friends, the general confidence of Seventh-day Adventist Church actually invests for your information a lot. 
about half a billion dollars in various investments, stocks, bonds, you know, all of this. Now, I'm not questioning. I'm just giving you an example, if you haven't known yet, that as leaders, they actually invest. And if they invest, they saw last year that, you know, during the pandemic that the reserve is going down in here because the members are not taught worldwide. Only the leaders know, but the members are not taught worldwide that all the principles are in the scripture. If the leaders know exactly how to use God's financial means to help everyone in this pandemic, and I believe the members will be helped too. So if the GC Treasury is investing in various financial companies and businesses, then the members should learn how to save, invest, and, di and diversify in various businesses and investment. Which are not mammonic in vision and, val and in mission and values because that is not being complacent because we are in the body and the, the principles are from the Bible. Isn't it time for church members to learn how to save and invest during this pandemic and diversify into various businesses which are not contrary to God's, you know, to God's principle instead of we are just taught how to return tithe, but we are not taught how to, how to you know, help. Others, how to help God's work, how to help our family, how to prepare during this time of pandemic. Should members wait for our local leaders to, to teach us how to do that? Everything is in the scripture, but we are not taught how to save and invest and diversify. Those are biblical principles. We are not to be complacent because if we are complacent, I believe you are so lucky in Norway. You have, I think you have good retirement there. Whenever I see Norwegians come to Thailand, and why are you here? And they say, we have a very good uh, system, retirement system. A lot of other countries in the world don't have. Let me go back again to the passage. Why does complacency kill? From the CSB, giving us another nuance of the passage. For the apostasy of the inexperienced, the fools, will kill them. Complacency is again given a meaning, apostasy. <laughs> Can you imagine? That apostasy is like wandering, you know. The wandering of the gullible will kill them. We are being gullible, right? If we do wandering and apostasy. In here, another, another passage. Backsliding of the naive will kill them. Again, complacency is termed as backsliding. That's a very big word, brothers and sisters and friends, that complacency will destroy us. Look at what happened to the Israelites before. It's a series of cycle of going back and forth. When God gave them freedom, they went back to being complacent again to apostasy, to bandage. Because God said, if you follow me, I will not enslave you. Other nations will not you know, captivate you, will not put you into captivity. But if you disobey me, I will give you diseases and they will come to you and besiege you. And you'll be under bandage. The Israelites were under 430 years and they humiliate you. And then again, God will send some deliverer to free them from that apostasy. It's a cycle, isn't it? That is applicable also in our time, this time. That this principle, this history is repeated in principle. Why does complacency kill? Here, this is already a paraphrase. Bible, carelessness kills. But the principle behind is again the same. Complacency is murder. In my understanding, this complacency is like murder by installment. Friends, brothers, and sisters, we know already that something has to be done, but we don't know enough. Or probably we know, but we don't do enough. That is being complacent. We are actually murdering our body, ourselves, our family by installment to some degrees because we are not doing enough. Well, it's not that the natural law, the eternal law will give its natural course and consequence. God himself will act. Zephaniah 1.12, at the time I will search Jerusalem with lambs and I will punish the men who are complacent. You see that? Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Well, if you are not a believer of scripture, I am not imposing you again, but there's a lot of warning. 
from the scripture in which the principles behind are actually applicable to any areas of our life today. It can be health, it can be finances, it can be relationship. Maybe you take your spouse for granted or anybody, other people for granted, and then the time comes. As, as believers of the Bible, we have this message in Matthew 20, 8, 20, that we teach all nations to observe, you know, we give everyone this message that we want everyone. There is an impending doom. We want everyone to be saved. And we are not, we are complacent. Oh, they are adults already. They know already. They're mature already. I don't need to remind them. Anyway, who am I? Their business, my business is not my business anyway. Here, the promise of God is if we do that, lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. But what is the opposite? The gospel has always a two-edged sword. One is a blessing, the other one is a curse. If we do not practice faithfulness, the other one is faithlessness. It's damnation over or against eternal life. Brothers and sisters, I am not again preaching the idea of judgment or fearlessness or fearfulness or something like that would really, you know, uh, uh, terrify all of us. I'm just saying that the biblical principles has two swords. <coughs> blessing. A blessing and a curse. And eternal life or damnation. It is our choice, brothers and sisters. If you do not understand what it means for us, like being complacent, try this one. Try driving. Try driving in a busy road. There is a traffic light. Disregarding the rules. And either you will end up, if you do not end up in jail, you will end up there in the cemetery because of violating the rules or the principles. Why does complacency kill? It's so clear in Revelation 3.16. So because you are lukewarm, in other words, complacent, and neither in hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. All right? The context tells about that lukewarm here is understood in a sense of complacency. For you say I am rich. This is not physical richness. It's a spiritual richness being used by, by Jesus here, being the author of this one, recorded by John. For I am rich, that is spiritual richness. I have prospered. He uses money. He uses here uh, richness to, to illustrate the spirituality of Laodicean church. I have prospered and I need nothing. <laughs> not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. What happens? It's been warned not just from several verses we read, from the whole Bible, complacency is actually one in many areas. When a preacher preaches, that is preaching against complacency. When somebody warns, that is complacency. When your teacher warns, that is com against complacency. When any, your parents, children, you're listening right now, when your parents are telling, telling you reminders, that is a warning against complacency. You listen, rather listen, if not, Something bad will happen to you. Here is a very well-known author, a messenger known by others as a prophet. She said, the message to the church of the Lord is saying is a startling denunciation and it's applicable to the people of God at the present time. The condition of the church today worldwide is the same as Laodiceans if we understand what it means. And that is something that we need to wake up because this this disease of Lady Sin right now is being lukewarm, being complacent, being, oh, it's okay. I am now a wonderful place now here in northern part. Is it? Can I, can I give an example? Please, please do not hate me. Oh, I, I, I love Norway. I love uh, Finland. Uh, this is a wonderful place. This is a lot better in, in the European countries, Scandinavian countries, a lot better than any other country around the world where we have a very good health system, a retirement system. I am just illustrating here. I'm not talking about the condition of each one financially. I'm talking about here spiritually, which is more important, which is that of the Laodicean. But let me give you some tips before I sit down. I mean, I'm sitting down already. I've finished my talk. How to avoid complacency. The same passions. Let me just give you in a quick succession. Number one, Revelation 3.18. Trade your righteousness with Christ's righteousness. The counsel here, Jesus is counseling. I counsel you to the seven churches to buy from me gold. That is spiritual, you know, understanding like figurative language. Refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may be clothed yourself 
and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Brothers and sisters, figuratively speaking, we may think, oh, I am well spiritually. I am okay. I am, do not buy the Ten Commandments. I am a very good to the letter of the law of the Ten Commandments. I'm not a violator like the rich young ruler. Well, I am, I am not a, you know, I am not a robber, not a stealer. I am not, a, I do not steal. I am not an adulterer. I am not, well, that is according to the letter of the law. But the law has a letter of the law and it has the spirit of the law. The principle of the law is love. It may not be written exactly letter for letter, letra for letra, according to the letter in the Ten Commandments, but the principle behind them in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, the principle of love in the Ten Commandments hang on them. The principle of love is eternally applicable. It's applicable to all religion. And that is the one following that letter of the law besides its intent of the law, that will not make us righteous. It doesn't mean that we will not follow it. But Jesus did it. And it is his righteousness. It is his obedience to the law. It's perfect obedience to the law. His righteousness that is the one that we need. Because our obedience to the law is like zero filthy rags. In, in, in the book of, of, of Isaiah, it's like a menstruation. The Hebrew word, like a menstruation, like a napkin filled with feces or menstruation. So dirty. In other words, our coming to church, even this time now, may be good, may be perfect, may be so righteous. Oh, righteous than anybody. If we do it as a means of salvation, that is zero in the eyes of God. We do that. Because God saved us. He clothed us with our with his robe of righteousness. That is what it means. He died on the cross for us because we cannot be righteous of our own self. It's a lot to talk about. I wish I had more time of this. But I'm just giving you tips. Number two, be zealous and repent. Repent means to turn about 180 degrees. What you were before, if anybody comes to you, example here in 319, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. In other words, discipline is a good thing. We usually have the word discipline and negative connotation. Like in here, we reprove. Somebody reproves us, discipline us. In, in, in my language, mubo ognabel, mahi obos dayon. You know what I mean? But in here, is be zealous and repent because that is how God actually saves his people. All right? Well, so clear in Proverbs, anybody who does not discipline his son does not love because the son would grow, become a wayward guy and end up in jail or maybe be killed. It's so clear. Be zealous and repent. Whatever that life you had before, away from God, away from it, full of waywardness, be zealous and repent. Be zealous in here is actually boiling in, in Greek. Be, be boiling in your repentance. It's full of spirit, not just being complacent and be so, you know, naive. Oh, nothing will happen. I don't care. I'm an atheist. Brothers and sisters, if we really are taking heed of the principles, we are to repent, not just buying Christ's righteousness. We are to repent. That is the second thing. The third thing here is listen to Jesus' voice and open the door of our heart. 320, behold, I knock at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in. Jesus, a member of the Godhead, is spirit. He can live with us by principle and mysteriously how he is able to live with us in his, by his spirit. I, I cannot explain. But he's knocking the door of our heart. Look at the door. The door is closed. There is no doorknob outside because the doorknob is inside. It is up for us in our own decision making. To open the door of our heart. To let Jesus come in. Because there are only two spirits. If Jesus is in our heart, the fruit of the spirit will come. Love, joy, peace. But if he is not there, the other spirit will come. Have you heard of some people possessed by the evil spirit? Because the, Jesus' spirit is not in there. All right? I'm not giving you a simplified, like, elementary type of theology. Friends, I'm giving you here idea that Jesus is actually waiting for all of us to repent. Is it about religion? It's about principles of life. It can be natural principles, supernatural principles. 
if you follow this principle, blessing in many forms will come. More material, not just only material, physical, but more eternal blessings will come to us. Amen? The last part, how to avoid complacency is so clear. Be a conqueror of complacency. 321, the one who conquers. What? The context is so clear. Conquers what? Conquers lukewarmness. Conquers complacency. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father in his throne. Brothers and sisters, friends, have we conquered complacency in our life? Physically, materially, health, or any relationship? Much more spiritually, are we being complacent? Have we conquered even in our fight against sin? In Hebrews 12, 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have we really conquered that to the point of that? You know, shedding our blood. Only Jesus did it. I believe nobody has done ever what Jesus did on the cross. He resisted sinning by shedding his blood on the cross. And we have not fought that struggle. Our struggle, this pandemic, is nothing compared to what he experienced on the cross. Or experience at this time, if you are experiencing stress caused by anything because of this pandemic, that is nothing. Rest assured, brothers and sisters, that Jesus did it all for us. And we just need to come to him and see those four things. Let me just summarize once again for all of us here. Trade your righteousness with our righteousness. This robe, hmm, we like our robe of righteousness, is nothing, it's so stinky. Trade it with His. Second, be zealous and repent. And third, listen to the voice of Jesus and open the door of our heart because He is waiting for us. And then we become conqueror, not by our own might, but it's His might because He gives us power when He clothes us with His robe of righteousness. Amen? Friends, I am so glad that I am not just a Christian, a believer, but also a Seventh-day Adventist because an Adventist is somebody who waits for the second coming of Jesus. And He said, I will come again. I will go to my Father's place and prepare a place for you. When I come again, I will take you with me to wherever I am. I will be with you. Are you coming with me? Are you coming with us? Are you coming with Jesus at this time? If you are coming with Jesus, then congratulations. You are not being complacent. Let us wait for Him. He's coming, but let us not wait with full satisfaction. Being complacent, no. Let us actively wait for Him. It is four points that we have. When Jesus comes, what a wonderful we will enjoy. Oh, this is our Lord. We've been waiting for Him. He is here coming for us. And we will not be those ones who will say, Oh, hide on us. The cliffs and mountain rocks fall on us because we cannot stare in the face of the one coming. Friends, it's a choice. Brothers and sisters, it's a choice. It's a choice to accept Jesus as our personal Savior. If it is your choice to accept Him as your Savior, even at this time, you are not being complacent. Jesus promised eternal life will be with us. May God bless all of us. Amen. Amen.